Let's pray together. Father, we ask that you would work in our hearts this morning and make us those who know your ways, those who know you, and as a result, Lord, make us people who never give up, those who know that it's always too early to quit, that while there's life, there's hope because you did not spare your own son, but graciously gave him for us. And so how will you not deliver us? Lord, make these things bedrock convictions for us and help us to walk in the truth, believing your word, relying on the power of your spirit, trusting that you will come. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. I would invite you to open this morning in the copy of the scriptures that perhaps you, ha- you brought with you. If you didn't, there's one in the pew in front of you, open to Psalm 124, and we'll look at Psalms 124, 125, and 126 this morning. If you were going to write a response to the history of Israel, and if you were going to think about the way that that God gave a child to barren Sarah. And even before that, the way that God saved Noah at the flood and the way that God saved the Israelites at the exodus from Egypt and then the way that he brought them into the land of Canaan and they faced seven nations, all seven more numerous and mightier than themselves. And they conquered them all. And then if you were to if you were to include the New Testament in this and you were to think about the way that, that God raised Jesus from the dead after it looked like the one that they thought was going to deliver Israel turned out not to be the Messiah, and that was proven by the fact that he was crucified. And then if you were to look at the early church and you were to say, look at, look at the, the opposition to them, the authorities in Jerusalem the unbelieving nations, and they've got this task to go and make disciples of all nations. How are they going to do this? I think Psalm 124 would be an appropriate response to all of this. Look at, just look at the first uh, two verses here. This is the truth for the whole of Scripture. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side. And and what's implied is what's going to be stated through the rest of the psalm. They would have destroyed us long ago. We never would have gotten off the ground. Noah never would have survived the flood. Abraham never would have had a child. Israel never would have been liberated from, from Egypt at the Exodus. And on and on we could go. None of this would have happened if it had not been the Lord who was on our side. Uh, This psalm, Psalm 124, breaks down into three parts, and each one of the three parts itself breaks down into three parts. So it's a a threefold, three-part psalm. And and so look at these first two verses here. Notice how it says, if it had not been the Lord, and then it says, let Israel say, and then it repeats, if it had not been the Lord. That kind of structure is going to repeat throughout the psalm. So verses 1 and 2 is the first section. And then verses 3 through 5 has, has then at the beginning of each of verses 3, 4, and 5. And it starts with people who rise up against Israel. And then it uses this water imagery to, to, to talk about their, their, uh, the danger that they faced. And then it returns to people that rose up against them. So it's like the Lord, Israel, and then the Lord. And then people and waters and people. And then at the end, look at verse 6, blessed be the Lord. And then in verse 7, it talks about escape from snares twice. And then it goes back to the Lord in verse 8. So it's like the Lord, escape from snares, and then the Lord. So this is a a very carefully structured psalm, these three parts, three parts of the whole psalm that each have three parts in themselves. And um, as we've been moving through these songs of ascent, you notice that 
if you've, if you've been here, I've, you've, you've seen this. Um, if you haven't been here, every one of Psalms 120 through Psalm 134, they're all headed by the words, a song of a sense. And in, in Psalm 120, it's as though the psalmist speaks as one who is in exile. He's away from the land of promise. And he wants to return to the land where he can worship the Lord. And in Psalm 121, which in some ways I think is, is maybe like a keynote psalm for this whole section, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Uh, this, this psalm is going to resonate through these, these songs that we're looking at uh, today even. And, and so he's, he's away from uh, the land, but then he gets help from the Lord in Psalm 121. And, and then in 122, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. So they're making their way to Jerusalem. And then in 123, he lifts up his eyes to the one who is enthroned in the heavens. So it's like he's arrived in Jerusalem and and he's worshiping the Lord there. And now 124, he's re- he seems to be reflecting. We never would have made it back if it had not been the Lord who was on our side. Let Israel now say. You, you know what he's, what he's doing when he says there at the end of verse 1, let Israel now say? He's saying something like this. Let all the people of God adopt this attitude and join in this confession. And then he repeats it. For them all to join in there in verse 2. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side. So let me just offer some applications of this. None of us, if, we, if we're believers in uh, Jesus, if we, if we are those who walk with the Lord, none of us should tolerate thoughts that, that go like this. I can handle this. I can do this on my own. None of us should tolerate any kind of thought of, I can earn God's favor. I can come up to his standard. I can deliver myself. No, no, you can't. And none of us should approach life thinking, I can pull this off. I don't know what, I don't know what it is you're facing. Maybe, maybe you got new bills confronting you. Maybe you got new responsibilities at work. Maybe you're looking for a job. Maybe you got a whole slate of classes you're about to start in, in on. Maybe you're thinking about raising your... Ch- I don't know what you're thinking about, what you're facing... You should not adopt the perspective of, I can handle this. You should adopt the perspective of, I'm going to rely on the Lord every step of the way. And then, and then when you come through, when he brings you through, this should be your confession. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side. Now, the psalmist is going to, he's going to characterize the whole history of Israel. And the whole history of Israel has been a story of the seed of the serpent trying to stamp out the seed of the woman. Um, from, from Adam and Eve in the garden to uh, Pharaoh trying to kill Moses to Herod trying to kill the baby, of Je- baby Jesus. This is the whole story. The seed of the serpent are at enmity with the seed of the woman. So at the end of verse 2, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when people rose up against us, verse 3, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. He's saying they would have destroyed us. And and think about, just think about the example of Moses in Egypt. If it had not been the Lord who was on Moses' side, he certainly would have died in the Nile River. Before that, if it had not been the Lord giving faith to Moses' mother, the child would 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 have never even made it to the Nile River. And then, and then, so there, there's the people, the, the, the human opposition in verse 3. And then verse 4, uh, the opposition is characterized in terms of floodwaters. Why does the psalmist do this? Why does he say in verse 4, then the flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. I think what he's saying is something like this. Uh, God's wrath was visited at the flood in Genesis 6 6 through 9 when when Noah was delivered. And and that expression of God's wrath at the flood, it comes to be something that that is used as a metaphorical description of, of human opposition to Israel across the Old Testament. So we read about that earlier in the service in Isaiah 8. 
You remember Isaiah, he talks about the king of Assyria, and he describes the king as though the king is, is a river that has overflowed its banks, and it's coming into the land like a flood, even up to the neck of, of the land of Emmanuel. And, and that kind of imagery, you can find it across the Old Testament. You can find it other places in Isaiah. You can find it in Daniel, in Jeremiah, in Nahum. It's all over the Old Testament, this imagery of the flood being used to describe human armies. And those human armies, they're spoken of as though they're going to come like a, like a tsunami and sweep over the land and the reason they're going to come is because the covenant-breaking people are going to suffer the curses of the covenant. And so it's, it's an expression of God's wrath that these human armies come sweeping over the land. And, and, and that is the connection to Noah's flood. It was God's wrath that brought the flood of Noah over the earth. Uh, so that flood imagery, it stems from Genesis 6 through 9. Uh, it occurs across the Old Testament, and I think that these patterns of thought stand behind Jesus uh, describing him, himself being crucified as a baptism that he had to undergo. You remember uh, uh, James and John came to Jesus and they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And he says to them, are you able to drink the cup that I have to drink or to be baptized with the baptism that I have to undergo? And and uh, they, uh, they said that they were able, and, and of course, he, he did not grant their request. But uh, the point is here that, that Jesus' death and resurrection is likened to a baptism because the wrath of God swept over him, and he was, he was immersed in the floodwaters of God's wrath. And similarly, in the baptism of believers, our immersion in water symbolizes our union with Christ by faith in his death under the floodwaters of God's wrath, and then our coming up out of the waters symbolizes our rising from the dead with Christ to walk in newness. And, and the psalmist, I think, is connecting Israel's sufferings to the flood of Noah here in verse 4. The flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. And then in verse 5, uh, this is not so apparent in the ESV. The words read, then over us would have gone the raging waters. But the word raging there is the word that was translated uh, insolent all over the, the, uh, so, the long psalm, Psalm 119. So we have these insolent people, and, and the waters of the insolent would have gone over the people in verse 5. So it's a return to human Im imagery. And, and these arrogant, proud enemies of Israel, the psalmist is saying, would have swept over us had it not been the Lord who was on our side. So just as only the Lord could deliver Noah from the flood, only the Lord could deliver Israel from the overwhelming power of her human enemies. But because the Lord delivers, praise God, he does. Because the Lord delivers the psalmist blesses the Lord in verse 6. You notice he's not saying, blessed be our armies. He's not saying, blessed be our ingenuity. Blessed be our own human ability. No, he's saying, blessed be the Lord, who has not given us as prey to their teeth. And here, these human enemies are characterized like ravenous beasts. Who, who devour people and chew them up. And the psalmist is saying, Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. And then look at the way that he characterizes the people of God in verse 7. We have escaped like a bird. There, there, you, remember, you remember Psalm 11? Why do you say to my soul, Flee as a bird to your mountain? And now it's like he's saying, Okay, we're a bird. And you guys are a fowler. The ESV has the word uh, from the snare of the fowlers. A fowler is a person whose job is to trap birds. So a fowler, if you think about this comparison, a human being with skill and ingenuity and snares and traps is trying to ensnare these birds. And the bird, I mean, there's a reason we have this expression, bird brain. They're, they're not that smart, right? They're not smart. They're not big. They're not strong. They're weak little nothings. 
And the psalmist is saying, we have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. And then he repeats it in reverse order. So he goes, escape from snare. And now he goes, the snare is broken and we have escaped. It's like, as, as, as I was reflecting on this psalm, I was thinking about um, uh, the two towers, J.R.R. Tolkien's novel. We're, we're uh, listening to this in the car with the kids right now. And um, uh, there's a point in the story where these two little hobbits, these halflings, half-sized people, uh, Merry and Pippin, they've been carried off by these massive, powerful orcs. And, and against all expectation, they thought that they were going to torture and certain death. And against all expectation, out of nowhere, here come the riders of Rohan. Rohan. To, to slay the whole of the orc host, and then these two little hobbits survive alive. And, and at one point, they're on the ground, and a horse, a horseman of Rohan, his horse comes running toward them, and then guided by some unseen power, just leaps right over them. And they escape. It's, 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 it's remarkable. It's just like the story of the Bible. And if you'll walk with God, it's just like your life will be. You will find that the Lord delivers you. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. Do you hear the, the surprise, the wonder? The snare is broken. That snare wasn't supposed to break. That sea wasn't supposed to part. That river wasn't supposed to stop flowing and there'd be dry ground for them to cross over. That dead man wasn't supposed to rise. That word wasn't supposed to pierce hearts. The snare is broken and we have escaped. And then he returns to the Lord in verse 8. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. You hear the echo of Psalm 121 there? Look back at Psalm 121, verse 2. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. What the psalmist is saying here is that the maker of heaven and earth, unparalleled of awesome power, he is the one who helps his people, though they are outmanned by human armies, though they're like twigs before a rushing torrent of water though they're like birds facing fowlers. Were it not for the Lord, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, they would not escape. But the Lord helps and delivers, and thereby he wins praise for his gracious love. Before we move on to Psalm 125, let me, let me ask you, are you certain that the Lord is on your side. And I want to take you to two texts in the New Testament. The first one is Romans 8, verse 32. And I want to invite you to think about this text. Hopefully, uh, many of us are in the process of memorizing Romans 8. This is a great passage to lay hold of. Romans 8, 32, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? If you're walking with the Lord and you're trusting him and you're uncertain that the Lord is on your side, let me urge you to lay hold on this verse. Lay hold on this verse. He didn't spare his own son. He is most certainly on your side. That doesn't mean you're going to get everything that you want. It means he's going to fulfill his purposes. It means, though, that he is for you. In the deepest and highest and best sense, he is absolutely for you. But maybe you're here this morning and you're not trusting, or maybe you're wondering if your trust is sufficient. Let me invite you to look at Romans 10, 13. This text says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The point is not the quality of our faith. The point is not the consistency of our faith. The point is His gracious power to save. He is a great Savior. We are great sinners. He is a great Savior. 
Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you're here this morning and you're not a believer and you want to be, you want Psalm 124 to be your testimony, this is what you do. Call on the name of the Lord. He will save you. Call on the name of the Lord. He will save you. Psalm 124 captures the against all odds unexpectedness of the Lord's salvation. He delivered Noah at the flood. He preserved Israel against Egypt, against the Canaanites, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and all others. And climactically, God saved his people from their sin by raising the Lord Jesus from the dead. And all of these existential threats uh, to God's people and to the the ongoing uh, holding to the faith, they're like floodwaters. But because Jesus was baptized into the floodwaters of God's wrath, the flood of Noah corresponds to baptism, which now marks the by-faith salvation of all who trust in Christ. As we move into Psalm 125, we have uh, five short statements here, and they build up to and out from the, the unique contribution of Psalm 125, which is in verse 3. And, and Psalm 125, verse 3 is like a restatement of Genesis 12, 3. You remember what the Lord promised to Abraham in Genesis 12, 3? He said to him, um, those who bless you, I will bless. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And that statement is like a reformulation of Genesis 3, 15, where, where the Lord said, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman and between her seed, he's talking to the serpent, between her seed and your seed, and he, the seed of the woman, is going to bruise your head. So, so the serpent is going to receive a, a head wound, which is, can be mortal, and, and then the seed of the woman is going to receive a heel wound. He'll be wounded in the process. Look at verse 3 of Psalm 125. The scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous. The wicked are not going to prevail. That's the unique contribution of this psalm. That's the, the, I would say, the central statement of Psalm 125. The wicked will not win. The psalmist is saying, look, evil is self-defeating. And God has promised he's going to curse everybody that opposes Abraham and his descendants. The seed of the serpent is going to have his head crushed. The, the scepter of wickedness will not rest on the land allotted to the righteous. Ultimately, what this means is Satan is not going to reign over the new heavens and new earth. And, and this is, this is a, great, a great foundation for hope. Whatever happens to us in this life, whatever happens to us in this life, God is going to raise the dead and Jesus is going to reign. Jesus is going to reign as God's king over God's place with God's people enjoying the goodness of God's standards. That's what's going to happen. Uh, let's go back to verse 1. And verse 1, I think, in the context of, of Psalm 124, is really interesting. Because we just had Psalm 124 where the psalmist was saying, we're like little birds. And now look at what he says in Psalm 125, verse 1. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. Isn't that beautiful? You go from being like this little bird, this, this weak little thing, to being like Mount Zion, which is immovable and it's secure and it's going to stand until the age to come. Why? Look at the first words. Those who trust in the Lord. Those who trust in the Lord. You know, both things are true. They're both true. You're like a bird. You're nothing before the face of the, of the overwhelming world, and you're like Mount Zion, steadfast, immovable. Both things are true at the same time. Absolutely. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. How, how is that the case? Look at verse 2. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. Isn't that beautiful? The Lord is our defender. There's this, there's this great picture in the book of, of Zechariah. There went my sermon notes. Um, there's this great picture in the book of Zechariah where Zechariah uh, talks about how the Lord is going to be a wall of fire around Jerusalem, shielding and protecting his people. 
as my sweet life, my sweet wife, help meet suitable. Hallelujah. Thank you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so the mountains surround Jerusalem, and in this way, the Lord surrounds his people. And then look at the last phrase of verse 2, from this time forth and forevermore. Look back at Psalm 121, verse 8. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. So you see how Psalm 121 is echoing through these psalms. It's almost like the psalmist wants us to go back to Psalm 121 and think about the way there he extolled the Lord's help and the way that the Lord would not let the foot of his people be. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. And because of that, verse 3, the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous. And then look at the purpose statement at the end of verse 3. Lest the righteous stretch out their hands to do wrong. The psalmist is acknowledging here that you put good people in a bad environment and they can be corrupted. And, and he's saying, the Lord is going to prevent that from happening. The Lord doesn't want his people to do wickedness. And so he's going to prevent the scepter of wickedness from reigning on the land given to the righteous so that they won't sin. And then verse 4, which I think in a way corresponds to verse 2. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good and to those who are upright in their hearts. Okay, so the Lord's going to protect his people that way. And here's the outcome for the wicked in verse 5. But those who turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord will lead away with evil doers. So those who are crooked and, and they, they're inclined to crookedness, the Lord is going to march them off with those who do evil. March them off to punishment. And this is going to, the removal of wickedness in this way is going to lead to, end of verse 5, peace be upon Israel, shalom. So God's people in God's place under the reign of God's king are going to enjoy the application of God's standards which will bring about this shalom, this good and lasting peace that God's people will enjoy. Application of Psalm 125. Just Here's one. There are all kinds of ways that this psalm applies to our lives. But here's, here's one. There's a lot of political uncertainty in the world. There's a lot of turmoil, both in our government and in the, the, the government of the nations. And let me urge you to rest in Psalm 100, 125, verse 3. Rest in this truth. The scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous. That's, that's one. Here's, here's another one. Verse 4. Do good... To those who are good. And, and, and I would urge you to hear Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, where Peter says in verse 3, he says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. So God's power gives us everything that we need. And, and listen how he tells us to respond to this truth in verse 5. For this very reason, because God's power gives you what you need, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. You do this. God's power gives you what you need, so do it. Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection. And, bro and he goes on this way. What he's saying is, what I'm saying to you is, the Lord is going to do good to those who are good. Make every effort to make sure that's you, because God has given you everything you need to do this. 2 Peter 1.3, 2 Peter 1.5, and following. I think that's, that's how we should respond to Psalm 125. The wicked look strong and powerful. Their conquest seems certain, but with the eyes of faith, we see through these appearances the wicked are not going to prevail. The wicked are going to destroy themselves by their iniquity. They will not reign. And God is going to protect his people and establish his goodness. 
Psalm 126. This psalm falls into two parts. Uh, in the first part, verses 1 through 4, there's a bracket uh, around these verses that's in this phrase, restored the fortunes of Zion, in verse 1. You see that when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, you're going to see it prayed in verse 4. Restore our fortunes, O Lord. Now, um, in the first three verses, what the psalmist is going to do is he's going to speak as though God has already done this. It's like he's saying, I'm going to project myself into the future, into the kingdom of God. When, when Christ reigns, when the Messiah, the future king from David's line, when he's taken up his throne and all things are established, and I'm going to imagine what that's going to be like. And listen to what he says. Psalm 126, verse 1. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. I'm not exactly sure what he means here when he says we were like those who dream. He might mean we were like the prophets. We were like the prophets who foresaw this reality and talked about it. You know, in Numbers 12 and in many other places in the Bible, uh, the Lord says, when I make myself known to the prophets, I reveal myself to him in, in, in dreams and visions. So this is the way the Lord reveals himself to the prophet. And, and it's like the psalmist perhaps is saying, when the Lord restored our fortunes as though it's already done, we were like the prophets who dream. Their reality that they foresaw became our reality. Or maybe, maybe he's talking about dreams the way that we talk about dreams. You know, these sort of, these sort of musings on the way that we would love for things to turn out. Maybe he's, maybe he's just saying that. I'm not exactly sure. When the Lord restored... Either way, though, what he's saying is what we had hoped for came to be reality, Right? That's what he's saying. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth, verse 2, was filled with laughter. There's this hilarity and this mirth that accompanies the surprised delight at what God has brought about. Our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. And then you get the response from the nations. In the middle of verse 2. Then they said among the nations, other people are looking in and saying, the Lord has done great things for them. And then in verse 3, they agree with the, the sentiment of the nations. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. There, there is just unmitigated celebration here. Unhindered exaltation at what God has done. But then it's in verse 4, it's as though he snaps back into the present. He snaps back into a, a perspective that is looking forward to the realization of all God's promises. And he says in verse 4, Restore our fortunes, O Lord. So he, he, he begins to pray as one who has not yet experienced the final redemption. And then he has this comparison. Uh, the Negev is in the southern part of of Israel. It's a dry place, and there are these stream beds that are sometimes referred to as, as wadis, and they have other words for them, uh, because they're common in that part of the world. Um, these stream beds that, that for a large part of the year, there's no water in them, but then when it does rain, you'll have these flash floods and this, this sudden, unexpected flow of water that comes rushing through these, these channels. And, and he says here in Psalm 126, verse 4, Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. He's praying for this sudden, unexpected, bountiful salvation that God brings about. And then in the, in the second part of the psalm, so I think verses 1 through 4 are, are, are sort of set off, bracketed off by this reference to the restoration of fortunes. And then verses 5 and 6 are like an application. So, so here I think the psalmist is applying the words of this psalm to us. And, and I'm going to put this much, much more prosaically right now than, than he puts it. He puts it very poetically, but I'm going to put it pro, prosaically. This is what he's saying. I know your life is hard. And I know things don't look like they're going the way you want them to go. And I know that, that in the midst of all this difficulty, there are tears and there's hard labor and it requires perseverance and it requires persistence and and I know that look back at Psalm 
123, verses 3 and 4. At the end of verse 3, we have had more than enough of contempt. Verse 4, the scorn of those who are at ease, the contempt of the... I know that people are mocking you. I know that they're ostracizing you and rejecting you. And in response to this, verse 5, those who sow in tears. That's what, that's what, that's what he's characterizing your life of faith as. It's like... Day after day, you're the sower, and you're going out in faith, and you're not seeing the results, but you're spreading the seed. And people are mocking you, and people are making fun of you, and your life is hard, and things aren't going the way you want them to go, and that's causing you to weep. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. This is the perspective of faith. He's saying the reason you keep going is because you know there's going to be a harvest. And when that harvest day comes, there is going to be gladness. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. And then what he just said in verse 5, he restates it, I think, to pick up Psalm 121 and also to reiterate it. So look at at how he talks in verse 6 about going out and coming home. Psalm 121, verse verse 8, the Lord will keep your going out and your coming in. I think he's alluding back to 121 again, and he says in verse 6, he who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. This is a poetic way of saying it's going to be worth it. It's a way of saying, look, if you sow in faithfulness now, there is going to be a harvest of righteousness one day. You will certainly rejoice one day. Faithful labor in sorrow leads to glad harvest. In in Psalms 124, 125, and 126, it's like we see three different responses of faith to the various, uh, the various things we encounter in life. In, in 124, we're small and vulnerable, like birds being hunted with snares set for us all around ourselves. But as we trust God, those snares get broken. And against all expectation, we get liberated. And as we trust the Lord... We become unassailable, Psalm 125, like Mount Zion, which abides forever. And then in these labors to remain faithful, Psalm 126, we face these sorrows that are created by the fact that we live in a fallen world and that stem from the the contempt of the arrogant, but we sow in weeping, confident that we will reap with joy. The reaping with joy comes after the great deeds that the Lord will accomplish for His people. Great deeds that will make us like those who dream, verse 1. Those whose mouths are full of laughter, verse 2, and ringing cries of joy. Uh, That prayer in verse 4, restore our fortunes, O Lord. Like streams in the Negev, I think that prayer has a New Testament parallel at the end of 1 Corinthians, Paul writes this word, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. It's a short way of saying, restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. And John, at the end of the book of Revelation, he closes the whole thing with, come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Father, would you... Cause Israel's history to resonate in our hearts. Cause us to be those who identify with their experience, this experience of being people who know that if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, we would have been certainly destroyed. We would have had to face your wrath with no mediator. But Lord, we praise you that you did not spare your own son. And we praise you that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And we praise you that you've given us everything that we need for life and godliness. And we thank you that you've summoned us to make every effort to add to our faith 
virtue. Lord, because we want to be those described in Psalm 125, verse 4, when the psalmist prays that you would do good to those who are, who are good. And Lord, we want to be those who dream with the prophets, those who pray with the psalmists, those who sow in tears that we might reap with joy. Make it so, we ask in Christ's name. Amen.